welcome to the call. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad you guys all could make it here. Uh, I've been working on this script for a good while now. And I think it's, I think it's at a point where at least I can show you the draft. And if there's, I don't expect there to be any issues with it, but if there's anything I should change, like, you know, this is, this is a no judgment space, right? You can give me a little feedback. Does that kind of sound good? Sounds yeah. good to me. Yeah. All right. All right. So not all of you have necessarily met each other. So we'll kind of just go through the, uh, the group here. So uh, here we've got uh, James. You want to wave your hand, James? So James, I brought you out today because, um, I mean, you're, you're a self-published writer. You know, you've done it. You've, you've put your words out there into the world. You've kind of refined your technique. I think you're, you're going to have a lot of insight for me here. And we've got, we've got Josh. Josh, you want to wave your hand? Uh, Josh is an aspiring writer who is really just has a penchant for putting in an absolutely ungodly quantity of detail. So I think that'll be really good if I want to spend just years and years continually refining my script and never actually finishing it. So I think that's really what he brings to the team here. Damn right. And so then we've got, okay, we've got Nicole. Nicole, do you want to wave your hand? All right. Awesome. So Nicole is another aspiring writer who, you know, published or not, there's nobody else on the planet, I think, I think, who writes better ogre erotica. Oh, that's and, very flattering. Thank agreed. you. Yeah. 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 Some of us already know this. So, and, oh, and of course we have Adam and Adam, I, you know, wave your hand and I, uh, I brought you here, of course, because you know you you minored in creative writing at the at the U of A, right? Of course. Yeah. So that's kind of why we're here. So I've got. To, does everyone have the script pulled up here? I right. sure do. Yeah. Got it on my phone, like a good millennial would. Oh, awesome. We've got some characters. They're all just kind of you know uh, characters that I think will fit well in this movie. And if each of you could read for a character, I guess. I figure we can just assign them arbitrarily as we go. I think so, that'll work fine. Yeah. And you know, this is this is not a table read. You're not actors. You don't have to really inhabit the character. We're just, you know, this is writing feedback. So uh, even if you don't feel like your character, you, you just read the words and we'll get through it. Okay, is everyone ready to go? Yep. Uh, yep. yep. Yes. So here's scene one. Fade in. Interior war room of some sort the president is surrounded by a cadre of advisors they are going back and forth with each other like they are disciples in the last supper but the president pays them no heed hand steepled the president is not just dashing articulate and jacked as hell but also a woman she is 35 old enough to legally be president but young enough to test well among key male demographics <laughs> She wears a smart pantsuit, professional enough to be taken seriously, but still revealing enough to test well among key male demographics. After a few seconds of intense staring directly into the camera, she speaks. And I don't know, let's assign someone at random. Nicole, do you want to be the president? Oh, I, I, I suppose I can, I can put myself in these shoes. All right, so just jump right into reading your line whenever you're ready. Gentlemen, please, the time for bickering is over. We've just lost another Carolina. We can't afford to lose time to put our time to our own egos. I thought that said eggs. Can't afford to lose time to our Sorry, own egos. Is that egos. a note? Do you want me to change it to eggs? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> that says a woman, I'm constantly thinking about the timeliness of my eggs and how they're rotting inside and, me. And at 35. 35. At 35, oh. that clock's a ticket. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, we are simply out of out of our depth. I think we can no longer we ha no longer have a choice but to listen to an expert, no matter how unconventional he may be. As she speaks this last sentence, a hush falls over the advisors. The president has commanded their attention with this completely unacceptable suggestion. Close up of one of the advisors, the Secretary of Health and Human Services. He is dashing, articulate, and jacked as hell. Normally immaculate, <laughs> clean shaven. He is sporting a two-day beard to show that he is working through a national emergency. Uh, I don't know. Adam, why don't you take this one? That's a two-day beard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's not an actor. You have not shaved for two days. That's what it means. Madam President, please. I know we've had our share of disagreements, and not just when we were together, but if you only listen to me, 
one time <laughs> let it be now this man is dangerous we cannot just go and implement his half-baked ideas the president drops her head quickly to hide that she is blushing as she's momentarily lost for words another advisor speaks up the secretary of energy he has a sallow pale face with sunken eyes greasy hair and an odor that you can almost see on screen unconsciously he wrings his grimy and unmanicured hands, his clumsy sausage fingers barely able to navigate each other, the motion belying the short sleeves of his ill-fitted suit. He smacks his chap lips together, clears his throat phlegmatically in a way that causes those next to him to recoil and begins to speak in his whining, nasal, intolerable tone. Oh, I guess we'll have to cast this. Ah, uh, uh, fuck. Um, Josh, do you want to be this person? I think I think I, I think I can embody this character perfectly. Again, I know you're not an actor, but you know you just you know do your best. But but you can't do this to me. I've stood by your side all this time, even though you told me we can never be together. Please, Madam President, if you just give me more time. The Secretary of Energy desperately, pathetically fumbles to pronounce produce a crumpled, oily note with childlike handwriting all over it. I, I believe I've hit upon the answer this time. You see, the key appears to lie in this manga I was reading. <laughs> the president cuts him off, raising her head again and wagging her finger at him, doing the opposite of blushing. That's enough, Secretary Poindexter. We don't have any more Carolinas left to lose. It's time to put in the call. Cut to exterior, White House, nighttime. A large, unidentifiable celestial object looms menacingly over the White House. A massive aperture in its center flares open with the spreading of a heavy metallic series of triangular hatch-like components, <laughs> revealing a glowing bluish-green interior. Dramatic <laughs> music swells. Interior, a cozy recording studio. <laughs> a Jeff Goldblum type sits before a condenser microphone with some sort of hippie bullshit tapestry hanging behind him. He is granola crunchy, far more crunchy than Aubrey Marcus, but far less crunchy than David Wolf. He has a mustache, although it looks uh, like he could easily grow a smart, tidy beard. In fact, it might even look great on him, better than the mustache. His concerned face is intercut with a view of a countdown timer on his laptop screen, which reaches all zeros as the dramatic music reaches its climax. A close-up of his face shows him raise his eyes from the laptop and mutter, uh, run out of people. I, uh, James, do you want to be this one? Uh, Jeff Goldblum type. Let's see what I can do. Um, <clears throat> time's up, ma'am. Exterior, White House, nighttime. <laughs> the large, unidentifiable celestial object continues to loom menacingly over the White House. The doors of its massive aperture begin to shoot blue-green lightning into a convergent electric ball, culminating in the sudden blast of a beam of greenish-blue energy down into the White House. Instantaneously, its windows all alight with a fiery glow, each bursting with a small explosion before quickly cascading into the full-blown destruction of the building with shrapnel flying in every direction. A dog jumps out of the way just in time. Oh, thank God. Cut to interior hallway. Flanked by Secret Service agents, a Matt Damon type escorts the Jeff Goldblum type toward the war room of some sort. The Matt Damon type, a retired Texas Ranger with a mustache, which he wears for professional reasons, but you can tell that he looks much better with a thick, luscious beard that is very sexy and lends some gravitas. Well, hmm, like you guys all have a role, so I, I guess I can just play this character. <laughs> you would leave that for yourself. You know, I just, random, you know? The character is just assigned random. Never, never written with anyone in mind each time, right? No. No, I need to understand uh, that these folks still don't really trust you. Hell, I sure as shit don't trust you, but if Madam President says you're the only hope we got, well, I reckon that's all we have. Do you uh, trust... Quick, sorry, quick what? note here. Um, why does yep. Matt Damon sound like Matthew McConaughey? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I didn't well, know he was you know, I, that I, to be honest, <laughs> I, like, I pulled a little bit of uh, inspiration here from uh from the matt damon's character in true grit which is basically him doing his matthew mcconaughey impression for like two and a half hours oh okay all right all right, all right all right if you if you look up him doing his mcconaughey impression on youtube you will absolutely see it's the exact same i've seen it and yes can confirm okay so i believe we were at the jeff goldblum type again uh yeah that would be me i'm uh, you know as 
you know, I'm not, a, I'm not obviously not an actor, but uh, I am a word person and part of my ignorance, but what the hell does smarmily mean? Oh, in a smarmy manner. What does smarmy mean? Kind of smug, I guess. Okay. Smug. Uh, should I cross my arms? Is it like smug, but like with a crossed It's arms? up to you. Smart, Again, smart. like there's no expectations of being an actor here. You can okay. even ignore the like the performer notes there. You know, okay. just, you, you read the words as written and, you know, say it how you want. Just trying to get into the role here. <clears throat> Do you trust Madam President? Man. Of course then you'll just have to trust that she's brought me in for a reason, man. <laughs> the group reaches the door of the war room of some sort, and the secretary, uh, I mean, the, the Matt Damon type stops and grabs the Jeff Goldblum type roughly by the shoulder. Now, listen, son, you can't make me trust you. In fact, I don't even think I like you. But I suppose, I suppose if it comes down to it, I've got faith in the Lord above that you're just a part of his plan. I weren't meant to understand. That's all I ask, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did you have notes? Me? <laughs> well, I, I just, uh, you know, what uh, note I have is I think you should cast me. I think you should cast me for this role. I feel like I'm really getting into it here. Like, no, absolutely. Whole new world is open out for me. Kelly, every role that you write for yourself, do you just find some way to make yourself a cowboy, basically? I don't know what you're talking about. We pick these roles randomly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It just kind of happened. I wouldn't say he's a cowboy. I'd say he's more he of a... He has a southern accent, which is like an element of a cowboy. I, well, coincidence, you know? Like, you, you write what you know. All right. The camera follows as the group enters the war room of some sort, with all of the advisors variously working away at piles of handwritten and typewritten dossiers. None look up, save for the president. Uh, oh. oh, Mr. Kessel, you're here. At this, all of the advisors look up in unison, first at the Jeff Goldblum type, then at each other. Yes, it is I, Kevin Q. Kessel, the humble citizen scientist who found access to your inner circle by the pure serendipity of my ex-wife working as the White House communication director <laughs> and whose warnings you have failed to heed for months now, which has led you to find yourself in this quandary. Indeed, all of your previous attempts at solving this existential threat through the lens of defense or of energy or of health and human services have failed. And now you have come back to me, finally ready to listen after laughing me out of the room. But only after, of course, losing your precious White House and your even more precious Carolinas. Truly, at this juncture, you finally must come to accept that the real answers were not within you as individuals, but within the very earth itself. Man. Can I, just a, a note yep. here, this is all seeming very familiar, um, the plot points. Is well, this you know, from... there's, they, they say, there's the uh, the monomyth, right? There's only like seven types of stories or whatever. It's right. all a hero's journey. This is like, almost seems like a word for word, um, like rewrite of, I want to say Boss Baby. Is that the right one? Is I anyone else getting Boss Baby vibes? Okay. Okay, maybe, I, have, maybe I, I have only seen one film, which is Boss Baby, but yeah, I'm getting a lot of Boss Baby vibes. From I this. was thinking it was Terrifier 2. I mean, I only saw the first one, mm. but this feels like if I would assume where that first movie was going in a sequel, this is pretty close. Right, totally. Yeah, the Jeff Goldblum type is giving me serious cl clown vibes here. <laughs> well, to be honest, I haven't seen that one either. So I really only know Jeff Goldblum from uh, 1986's The Fly. So <gasps> that's it. That's what he's ripping off. I get you. I, get you. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that. <laughs> Wasn't he I'd also in that uh, that space movie with the dinosaurs? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Prometheus. That has dinosaurs yes. in it. <laughs> That's the one. Yes. Well, well, it did. If you watch the deleted scenes, there was a real. There's a big dinosaur narrative that they cut out and post, which I thought was crazy. 
the -hmm. whole like lore of that movie is that the blue guys are like crossbred with dinosaurs right and we're all descended from space dinosaurs yeah i think so i think that was it it's been a while it's been a while well you can't accuse me of plagiarism because there's no space dinosaurs in this movie i promise i mean yet not to spoil anything (laughs) well let's 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 move a little further and see how we go Poindexter tries to spring to his feet, but his sedentary and uncoordinated nature cause him to fumble pitifully and flop back to his seat, humiliated. Undeterred, he points a wretched finger at Kevin Q. Kessel. Enough! This man has no credentials. He's just a... Just a... a pu- Ugh, a what, Mr. Poindexter? A podcaster? Yes! Madam President, with all due respect, this is a room full of professionals, the most distinguished experts in all our respective fields. We cannot... The President rolls her eyes and sighs loudly enough to cut him off. Is that so, Mr. Chadrick? The President reaches to her right and spins around Poindexter's laptop for the rest of the room to see. That crazy zoom shot from Django Unchained to reveal that Poindexter has been playing a completely inscrutable anime bullet hell game like some kind of pervert. I, Mr. Pre- Madam President, the abominable Secretary of Energy notwithstanding, you must understand. The President reaches to her left and fans out Chadrick's dossier, causing a cascade of titillating but sensible nudie magazines to spill <laughs> out for the rest of the room to see. Titillating but sensible. Do you have like a list of like which nudie magazines you would want to use for this? Well, scene? for copyright reasons, they have to be fictional. Oh. Oh, so you couldn't actually use the 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 hentai of titillating. I think there's a hentai <laughs> called titillating, a uh, collection of unless they're willing to do truly like remarkable a, stories a licensing deal. But I feel like that's a lot of steps ahead in the production process. Do you want you know? to describe the content of titillating? Uh, <laughs> that would reveal whether or not I'd read it and, and public domain. <laughs> Not to be confused with To The Later, which is like a, actually a very, um, very cool manga uh, hentai about um, an older an older woman. So, well, I mean, I'd rather have a Tita now, but I mean, you know, To The Later is cool, too. Yeah, it's, it's really it's really good. It, it takes away like the age shaming. All right. Where were we? Uh, everyone present stands in total silence, save for Kevin Q. Kessel, who chuckles softly. Finally, the president gestures demurely with her hand to Kevin Q. Kessel. Uh, I know why we have a satellite disruption, man. The president takes a few steps toward Kevin Q. Kessel. All right, go ahead. Okay. Uh, let's say that you, that you... Let's say that y- you want to uh, coordinate with machine elves on different sides of the Earth. They wouldn't send a direct signal, right, man? I'm starting to feel like maybe I was made for this role. I feel like I'm really <laughs> connected with the character. He's, yeah, well, he's... You know, I'm discovering myself as a writer. Maybe you're discovering yourself as an actor. You know? Hey, that's it. That's it. Yeah, it really feels like I'm stepping into a new me. Totally different. Totally like a part of me I never thought I'd be exploring. And it's really Just great. A natural, natural fit. These, yeah, these lines are still coming off as like a. It's, it's like I've heard them before. Is this? Am I thinking Santa Claus Two? Haven't seen it. Oh, okay, cool. Never mind. Uh, ignore me then. Um, you're talking... It's actually from the Bible too. I heard that that was coming out soon. Yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm, a big, so, I'm a big Bible I've been fan. Waiting for sure. so long for that sequel to come out, like almost as long as I've been waiting for the next Name of the Wind or Way of Kings book. Like similar. That's a jerk for all you fantasy nerds out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're talking about Line of Sight. Oh. oh, right. There's a placeholder there. You can you can just read the placeholder if you feel like you've got it. Like you you are acting. Maybe you can just riff that. Uh, no, I can't just riff. <laughs> I can't riff that. <laughs> Despite the many hours I've spent uh, watching Star Trek, I cannot techno babble, invoking polyvagal theory or some such drivel. Placeholder for a bunch of turgid techno babble that evokes polyvagal theory or some such drivel like evokes polyvagal theory and the fact that like everyone in the room has now like started at uh, sympathetic agitated and aggressive against me to the until i 
just over dominate so much so with this garbage that uh, they descend into their dorsal vagal response and go into a full death feigning shutdown. Honestly, I, you did it perfectly. I would just take that <laughs> as the line. Uh, point Dexter. Oh, I already said preposterous. Sorry, oh, I was so into, oh, oh, I was so into the moment that I just oh, I went with it naturally. Okay, so yeah, wow, this is really crazy. I feel like we're really stepping into these roles. Okay, uh, <laughs> they're using our own mycelium networks against us, man. Kevin Q. Kessel opens his briefcase packed to the brim with psilocybin mushrooms. <laughs> the clock is ticking, man. <laughs> Chadrick narrows his eyes at Kevin Q. Kessel and begins to walk toward him. And just what do you propose we do, sir? Mr. Chadrick. Sorry. Chadrick? You having you having a hard time there? <laughs> let's let's take that again from uh from the president's line. Mr. Chadrick? Did you have a revelation while you tripped? Man. Secretary Chadwick. Chadrick. Are you people familiar with the stories about Mushroom Santa, man? <laughs> Chadrick explodes with anger. He looks ready to take a swing at Kevin Q. Kessel. You little fucking, is this a joke to you? Chadwick. Wait, it does say Chadwick that time. Did we change his yeah, name? You read the line as written, yeah. Chadwick. Chadwick stops mm -hmm. in his tracks, stunned by the use of his first name in this setting. <laughs> All stupid. present stare at their hands, <laughs> shuffle their feet, or otherwise fidget awkwardly. Why don't you ask the president, man? There is a moment of profound tension before the president speaks. I'd like to know what the Secretary of Defense thinks. All eyes turn slowly to the Matt Damon type the reserved yet brash Secretary of Defense. Now, I ain't a man of too many words, but I reckon it's time I made myself damn clear here. This man that already done stood for us, been told to get gone, and now stands among us in this, our darkest hour. Well, if I were a betting man, and I surely am, I'd say this man is a buffoon, a coward, and a miscreant. Ain't no two ways about it. After a beat, the president gives a long sigh. I'm mad that your last name is McCaller. <laughs> oh, I, I just used like a name generator. They just come out this way. <laughs> Do you trust him, Secretary McCaller? The Secretary of Defense looks over toward Kevin Q. Kessel, then back at the President. With my life. The President raises her eyebrows at McCaller. Madam President. Fade out. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I don't know. What did you guys think? You know, I, I feel like it's pretty much ready to, to send in to, I don't know, who's a famous director? Jordan Peele? J.J. Abrams. Uh, ooh, J.J. Abrams might be the perfect one for this one. I think so, Werner too. Herzog. <laughs> Werner Herzog. <laughs> Being that it's it basically a uh, total plagiarism of Prometheus Park, uh, I think J.J. Abrams <laughs> would probably make a nice, fancy version of it. With a lot of lens flare. I think uh, Darren Aronofsky has just finished a movie. He's probably looking for a new project. You should Is hit him up. True? Maybe Brendan Fraser could be in this one too. He could. He could he play could. the he could play the Matt Damon type. I feel like absolutely. Uh, I was getting a lot of Brendan Fraser vibes coming from you there, Kelly. I would, yeah, I there, watch there's that. a lot of people that could play the Matt Damon type. We'll 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 get to it. I think I, I've got a few ideas, but I'm keeping them pretty close to the chest. Probably not Matt Damon though. Certainly, right? Oh. No, he's too old for it now. He's got to be strapping and handsome, and you know, good at improv. I just remembered what movie I was thinking of. It was that one that's like about like this that small holiday totally that some people it. celebrate. Groundhog Day. Bill oh, Murray. There it is. I might have been ripping off Groundhog Day. I will have to go back and look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Other than that, no notes. All right. Well, everyone, welcome to uh, Boys Ultra Poggers, the 
all video games all the time podcast in which we talk about the uh no girls allowed where we get, you know we just like boys get together and we talk about the games that are just ultra poggers <laughs> And uh, we've already lost someone. Oh, God, that's right. <laughs> no girls around, allowed. Uh, yeah, and uh, I uh, I couldn't be happier to uh, to have everyone here. And uh, the the real story today is that we are in fact we're gonna we're gonna do a new segment here on the show, uh, one that Nicole has been pushing for since day one, and that's the sincerity hour. So I don't know, Nicole. Do you wanna do you wanna present this to the people? Well, first I have to interrupt here. If uh, if there's gonna be sincerity involved, as we all know, I don't really do sincerity. So this is where I disappear, folks. Yeah, that's if right. Was, You're if, uh... if sincerity hours were only for people that normally do sincerity. I would be the only one here. It would be me and James. <laughs> 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 Bye. I don't I don't know what to put you, Adam. I'm sorry. <laughs> Look, we're not gonna say. name names as far as who has difficulties with sincerity. Um, but we're just gonna we're just gonna do it as a group. So I believe the rule is uh, I, I was gonna have a really cool theme made and I didn't. So uh, I, do you want do you want to sing a little theme here for Sincerity Hour? Do 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 Sincerity do do do. Did I do it? Yeah. Sick. Putting so, the sin in sincerity. Putting the sin, yes. See, I was about to say that's a good <laughs> slogan. I was about to say that now that the theme had finished, we were officially in the sincerity hour, and there were no bits and no jokes allowed. But I don't know. It's your, it's your show here, Nicole. Do you want to take the reins? Oh no, that's just the caption I wanted to make, and then now we can move forward with the the sincerity. Yeah, I. Are there rules for sincerity hour? Be be sincere. The end. Well. Okay, so in our, in our pre-show chat here, James, you mentioned, so as a little bit of, uh, you know, behind the scenes here, this is an activity, or this is based on an activity that you've adopted into your show, Adventures Through the Mind. Feel free to plug it. Uh, do you want to, you said you might want to kind of explain what it is and why you use it, and then we'll kind of facilitate it. Does that, that make sense? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so what you're speaking to is, um, and I feel embarrassed. I don't remember the name of the person. Maybe someone can pull it up. Um, but, uh, a conversational structure called the conversation cafe, which, uh, sort of operates as a way of holding a larger group into a single discussion that ranges, it'll explore and it'll sort of expand, but it always, uh, rests onto a central question that guides the conversation. And there's a collection of different sort of uh, agreements that are read for people like speak from speak from the heart. Another one is like, go, go for depth, but don't go on and on. Um, and my experiences of doing conversation cafes is that it seems as though it allows something about the structure allows for groups to go in very deep um, in a way that feels really meaningful on a topic. Um, without feeling um, uh, without feeling constrained. Even though there's a structure, it's not a constraining structure. It's a kind of liberating structure. So um, what I what I did for the podcast is I felt like it would be really interesting to create or like uh, utilize this kind of conversational structure in a podcast situation where I could then share those conversations out and have the topics be relevant to the uh, relevant to my show, which is usually something with respect to psychedelics and the guests for the conversation, the participants to be selectively curated um, around that question. And so I started a micro series inside of my podcast called the psychedelic cafe. Um, and the hopes is that it sort of not only creates an exploration of content that wouldn't otherwise be you know seen or like um wouldn't otherwise be available elsewhere because there's something about the unique meeting of individuals that there's a kind of mind that emerges in the conversation between and amongst the uh, the participants that cannot be prepared for and can never be repeated because it is so context specific but also beyond the content level a kind of 
a conversation that on the process level is quite different than most of what you'll experience um, in the podcasting sphere, which hopefully itself could be used as a sort of modular structure uh, for people to then carry off into their lives. Um, because I didn't invent this conversation cafe and the instructions to make one or do one with your friends and family are uh, readily available on the internet. So that was a bit of a ramble. Did that all make sense? Is there anything else that you y'all feel like I may have left out? No, uh, I think uh, uh, that makes sense to me. Yeah, I think that's very cool. That's the, this is the first time I've heard of this. So this is, uh, you, you would be the expert. And I think, yeah, I think you did a great job explaining. So you're trying to improve the quality of conversations and also create an environment and structure that does so. Yes. Yeah, something like that. I mean, <clears throat> quality of conversation is a... Um, it's an... Uh, what denotes a, qual the, a quality conversation? Is it quality simply from a neutral sort of a assessment of, of what it was like, or is it quality in accordance to a certain sort of marker that would suggest that it is of higher or lesser quality? And then what would that marker be? Like one of those markers could be a depth of, a depth of meaningfulness, a sense of meaningfulness that's present for the participants, or a sense of accessing a kind of space in the conversation where something emerges that, that seems like important and meaningful that was sort of contributed to by all parties. Um, if that would be the marker, then I, my experience is that the conversation cafes can bring quite a high quality conversation, um, or at least the, the structure. Yeah. Cool. All right. Should we dive right in? Yeah, so I had kind of pitched this earlier, Nicole. Are you are you comfortable kind of like being the facilitator based on that uh that's that simplified structure as written in the chat there? Um I think so. Yeah. So, um would you like me when you say facilitate, would you like me to like moderate and like make sure well, maybe we can sticking to you or should we just there's only four of us, so we could probably just, because I had expressed, like, I don't want to facilitate, I just want to participate, but it feels mm -hmm. like it puts you in an awkward situation having never even sort of, uh, you know, been, <laughs> never even rubbed up against the thing uh, to then try to, like, hand it off or something. Um, but the, the why don't we try this so that it's not, we're doing, what, like, tw 20 minutes in this? In this? Yeah, or even, uh, like, at most, we, we ran a little long on the opening bit, so. Okay, so what we could do is just there's a central question i think kelly that you made you can pose mm -hmm. the central question and what we could do is we could start by going around first and each person on the first round will just share one clear coherent thought on that question speak as though you're answering the question with the with the sort of preface of what is on my heart and mind with respect to this question so speak from personal experience, speak with sincerity. And a single thought is not this and this and this and this and this. That's the idea of like go for depth, but don't go on and on. So try to hold it to a single thought. As it goes around, you don't have to respond to each other's thoughts. Um, it can be your own. It doesn't have to feel related to what the other person just said. Um, the second round is an open, dis well, I think we'll just do the three rounds like the Psychedelic Cafe. I think that was Kelly. That's what you're saying would work. Um, yeah, the I second round would be an open discussion um, where anyone can speak at any time um, and respond to things or do total non sequiturs or say something it feels like nobody else is saying but feels like it's in the room. And then the third round is everyone shares one clear, coherent, concluding thought based on what came from them in the, in the conversation but with respect to what the central guiding uh, inquiry or question was. Okay. Yeah. So should I throw out the question as I kind of had drafted it? Sure. Mm -hmm. So the question that I thought would be an interesting one to answer is what does Christmas mean to you personally? Like whether like what's your relationship is with it? What's your kind of general opinion on it? I don't know. I guess I just keep it open-ended. Okay. Did you want to start? Uh, yeah, it's kind of whoever's ready to go is first, right? 
Yeah, mm -hmm. I kind of assumed that would be you since you drafted the question, but that might be presumptuous of me. Uh, I'll leave it open if anybody has a wants to jump in with their their one thought, kind of like a minute. I think is the idea. But I also can jump in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely been on my mind. I saw, you know, uh, a few people on some online communities I'm on talking about like having bad Christmases and growing up and whether they wanted to like reclaim it or not. And yeah, I guess the main thought I'm thinking right now is that the way it's kind of exists in the zeitgeist is really one dimensional and structured like this specifically is what Christmas is. It has like these songs and these decorations and these traditions. And for the kind of for the the game we're going to do today, uh, I ended up doing a pretty deep dive research into the history of like Christmas and Christmas figures and Christmas celebrations. And it's never been one thing. It's changed so much that we're just looking at like a, a window, a very brief snapshot of what it is right now, but it has always changed. It will continue to change. And yeah, I guess that's sort of my thesis statement is that like, I, I would like to see people like look at it more outside the box because the general idea of having like a winter solstice celebration is ancient and you don't have to do it the prescribed way. You can do it however you want. Yeah, is that, is that pretty concise? So personally, I would say Christmas kind of has like a strangely dichotomous feel uh, in that my personal experience has always been quite positive. Uh, it's basically just time to spend with my uh, close family, my parents, my sisters, and occasionally extended family that I do not see very often. Uh, the context is always a little strange because you're like sometimes listening to Christmas songs, etc. And it there seems to be a generational gap as well, where uh, a lot of the times what me and my sisters want to do is basically just like watch movies and hang out and like eat food. And then some of the more traditional takes on the holiday are they're they're almost like uh, vestigial and just hanging on out of uh, like repetition's sake. It's kind of interesting to observe. And then the flip flip side, I would say, is like the consumerist aspect of it, which feels sometimes abrasive or like it degrades the holiday or puts strange pressures on you to uh, like financially express your value of other people, which is bizarre. And that's that's how I feel about Christmas, I guess. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, I guess. So my, uh, I also have a bit of a two sided view of Christmas. So, um, I know when I was younger, I had a very, um, I had a hard time with Christmas. It, uh, when my parents split up, it was like a really rough time of the year for me. Cause I was always, it was kind of awkward trying to navigate their separate lives and their like um desire to be spending time with me um and try to make that a fun happy family time um so for a long years i was long while i was trying to convince my family to like boycott christmas or like change it I'm trying to convince mostly my brother to like get on board with me on it um and then i met um the man that i ended up marrying me marrying um who had a bit more of a a less complex um, relationship with Christmas. He really enjoys Christmas music. He enjoys spending time with his family. It sounds like he has um, more of that, what you were talking about, Adam, that spending time with the family, eating food, watching movies, hanging out, um, having a really good time with his, with his family. Um, and so he is teaching me to love Christmas again. <laughs> um, so I'm getting a little less grinchy every year. Um, yeah, it's it's really nice. Uh, so, on on at risk of adding more than one thought, uh, mm -hmm. growing up, Christmas was a big ordeal 
in my house. And it's because my father was a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, my parents were together, still are together. My father was a Jehovah's Witness and my mother was a Pentecostal. And so I don't know if you know much about Jehovah's Witnesses, but it's like, it's very sterile. Um, like no holidays, uh, like you're not supposed to celebrate holidays and so on and so forth. So my dad was just very against these things. No holidays, no birthdays, etc. He was against them, but my mom was for them. And the sort of balance of divide there was, okay, so she could do whatever he wants, but he's just not going to participate in making it happen. And mind you, when Christmas actually came, he was very excited to get whatever gift he was getting and participated, but pretended like he was still being <laughs> a good Jehovah's Witness by not having whatever. But I think my mom, she took that as like, okay, well, I'm going hardcore. And for many years, she would deck our house out during Christmas. Like we were walking into Santa's village or something like, um, like w walking into a, a Christmas village. Like she even had like a really beautiful, like Christmas village miniature that she'd set up and like the whole house would be decorated. And, um, yeah. So nowadays that's, really softened a lot as my my father left the church and that sort of those pressures aren't really there anymore and um it has kind of become this thing that's mostly for the kids my nephews and our family has sort of shrunk down we had a lot of extended family growing up and people are living elsewhere with different lives and different families and etc and so it's kind of gotten into this very small thing that is like mostly just for the kids my mom and my dad and my sister and the kids and um and that's great. That's really nice. I also struggle with that consumerism thing that's been spoken to a couple of times, especially when there's so much like hoopla about gift giving for the kids, which I feel really uncomfortable with, but it, they're not my kids. <laughs> I don't get to make that decision. Um, and uh, I mean, it's not, it's not super excessive, but to me, I'm like anything more than one gift feels like too many gifts or something, or maybe I'm just being a grinchy. Um, but nonetheless, this year I'm excited because my partner's family is going to be coming for Christmas Eve with my family. And that'll be like the first time that I've had that happen. So that feels exciting. Um, oh, a third thought, which is that because our family unit has been small for the last few years, we've sort of like reached out to any friends that we have that don't have family to be on Christmas to come be at our Christmas Eves. So we've sort of like adopted like uh, Peter Pan lost children on Christmas Eve for the last several years. My mom and dad have been really awesome with uh, welcoming my friends in so that they didn't have to be alone on Christmas Eve. Uh, yeah, so that was a little ramble, more than one thought, end of the first round, I guess. Sweet. So yeah, now we kind of just have like an open forum about what we just talked about. Well, now we're kind of break out into open discussion and anything, anyone can say anything about whatever is alive for them with respect to that question or what others have said or not said. Although the encouragement is not to speak directly to each other, but to speak into the circle as if everything spoken is to the entire group. And so there's never any crosstalk, even if one person is talking to specifically to something else that somebody else said. Okay. I, yeah, I had a thought that uh, actually came up when you guys were talking about the consumerism aspect of it, um, which I yeah, really, yeah, I, I agree. That's, that's part of the problem that I have with Christmas and part of the problem that one of the reasons that I was cheering for us to boycott it. Um, but I, so I read a, or listened to the audiobook of Hillbilly Elegy, it's called. Um, it's basically a, a book about um, a guy who grows up uh, quite poor in the States somewhere. I don't remember exactly where. Um, and there was a point that I really connected with where he was talking about Christmas and how his family for Christmas and the kind of the thing that you would do for Christmas is everyone, everyone he knew was dirt poor, but everyone's families would basically at Christmas go out and spend beyond their means to spoil their children, to make their children feel like they weren't poor and like they were getting something, get, getting, I guess, yeah, getting the, the best Christmas that they possibly could. And they would spend beyond their means and they would um, go into debt doing this. And then they would spend like the next like four to six months trying to pay off this debt. 
Um, and then they would do the same thing again next year. Um, and I remember, so I, I was, yeah, not very well off when I was younger. Um, I, yeah, I remember there being lots of financial issues when I was a kid. And I specifically remember my bi- getting very lavish electronic gifts for Christmas and all these like big cool things. And it's like, it really struck me that that was why that was why my parents were doing that and that why that was or that that was something that was not like isolated to my family is that it's you know this overcompensation this feeling that in order for our kids to have a good christmas we need to buy them these things and we need to spoil them and they need to have this and they need to have that we don't want them to you know feel like less than when they go to school and talk about their gifts and um yeah i think it really feeds into that consumerism culture even for people that can't afford it um and it sucks (laughs) I think there is something more to that as well. Uh, And I think there's something beautiful in like wanting to give your children gifts and like provide them a certain quality of life and all that kind of stuff, make them feel loved. But also like if you do it purely through gift giving, there are other ways to show that you value your children. If you do it like primarily through gift giving and like put a lot of emphasis on that, it does like teach them certain ways of showing affection in addition to it like teaches them to seek new and like fancier objects all the time as like a form of uh i don't know improving their own personal quality of life right now uh in that it doesn't really like work super well as an adult uh and that stuff is like super ephemeral and like it like makes you feel good for a moment and then you forget about it like hedonic adaptation is real uh, I don't think it sets a great precedent for like how to be frugal or even humble uh, to your children, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, I think it's come up a lot in our discussion here, but it definitely is one of the main themes that comes up, just how people discuss Christmas in general is you get the words of like the consumerism or just like the financial strain. And it's interesting how that that way that gift giving and like is set up in this really specific and constrained way. Like everyone buys gifts for everyone. And, you know, there that doesn't like correlate with maybe how able you are. And, you know, you, you probably can't help but feel like a little bit different when you get something that's really uh I want to say nice, but I guess like specifically financially valuable or not. And it, you know, brings me back to the history stuff again, because I have been reading about it, but the, like the origins come from kind of two places. There's some origins of gift giving in, you know, pre-Christian pagan stuff. And, uh, but a big part of why we give gifts at Christmas comes from the, the 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 acts and deeds that were ostensibly performed by Saint Nicholas, like before he got amalgamated into the Father Christmas character and into these, you know, Santa Clausy characters, uh, the actual saint, or you know, as historical as these stories and uh like biblical the scriptures are, but the main kind of gist of that sort of gift giving, and that was actually a big part of the early Christian church, was giving specifically to the poor and the needy. So in in its origins, the point was, if you had means, this was a day, if any, to go out and give to people who were in need. And it's, it's interesting how that gets turned around so backwards when it's now the people who are in need are being put under more financial strain or more strain of their means rather than less, which was arguably the original intention. And yeah, it just sort of like circles back to that main thought I have of like the way specifically that we do it doesn't have to be the way we do it for all the reasons we've been talking about, but also like very specifically it was done in different ways before. And I think there's a lot to be learned from those ways. Hmm. What Kelly was just speaking to and uh, what has been brought up a handful of times about like shifting away from things that as I've gotten older, I've noticed like, oh, this doesn't really work for me. When I was a kid, 
getting lavish with gifts and like knowing that like after all the gifts were given the big gift would came i love that shit i was about it as an adult i'm like ah uh, as much as i still liked those gifts i don't think it makes sense and starting to wonder about realistically what does make sense to have as christmas traditions if yeah now that we're all adults and one of those things that does not make sense is everybody everybody buying everybody else a gift Right off the bat, it's because I'm a, you know, I'm in the sort of peak income generating years of my life. I don't need anything as a gift. Like I will appreciate gifts if they're sentimental, but I don't need my parents who are living on retirement to be buying me things that I wouldn't just buy myself. Right. And I also recognize there's a lot of fun and play and positivity that can come in a kind of gift giving. And so one of the things that our family has done is we've shifted over to doing like um, a secret Santa thing where everybody is given, this is the amount, it's a very reasonable amount, it's about $30, buy something that is somewhat gender neutral or could go either way. And then we do like a game where there's like a secret Santa, nobody knows what it is, and you can like steal the gift. And so it like becomes play, but it can only be stolen so many times. And it's like, it creates a sort of like fun opportunity to sort of lean in um, and that being a part of it being a part of also gathering together on these days because I mean, Christmas isn't too long after the darkest day of the year, which is still dark days for at least a month, you know, a month and a half before it starts to lighten up a bit again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I had a similar experience with my family where um slightly different. It's not in that like my parents are on retirement. My parents are like the most affluent members of our family. Like we're all, you know, I think comfortable enough in our own ways, but my parents are just like they're they're super affluent and suburban. So they have the means to just keep buying people gifts and it had to kind of be uh me and my one brother in particular kind of pushed back to like nobody in this family really wants for more stuff at this point. So can we scale down buying everyone everything into we've turned into sort of a gift exchange where like there's four pods. There's my parents, there's my brother and sister-in-law, there's my other brother and his girlfriend, and there's me and me. And uh it's uh like so you give to one of the other pods. But like I think the first time we did a draw for like a rotation, I think because we actually did it as like, you know, five, six, seven individuals. Um, but we've simpled it down into four pods and you just know who you're buying for this year because it rotates and like that's fine by me but it's still stuff I don't need because like I don't really need anything and there's stuff that uh, especially me and the same brother have kind of also worked in there like hey let's make the theme this year like stuff you can consume so like bottles of wine baking anything that is like kind of a part of the normal flow of your life anyway um, or experiences we've done stuff like that like i've done that for uh my other brother has three kids and they they get like a lot of stuff as is kind of like you know we did growing up and i'm like i, I i'm not going to just go buy those kids more toys they have enough and they they don't feel like uh oh hey you know like certain uncles aren't buying us more toys so i usually kind of try to go out of my way to like i think one time i like uh like one thing they actually like is getting little like certificates it's like a coupon for a nature walk like costs zero dollars but the kids feel like you're spending time with them specifically and they love that and like if you don't continually reinforce the idea that christmas is about like the toys and physical presence like kids are smart like they can be attuned to the idea that a gift can be time spent or that a gift can be something else so yeah, there's 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 that too. Yeah, experience gifts have been huge. Like my partner and I, whenever we get gifts for the nephews now, it's like we lean towards experience, um, experience gifts. They're like nine and under. They're not watching this. So for example, instead of getting them gifts this year, what we decided to do was collectively, it's also my sister's birthday shortly afterwards, that we would take us all to the to the Ripley's Aquarium in Toronto, which is this massive aquarium i got some issues with aquariums ethically but like as an experience for the kids to have um it's like yeah this is this is great other times we've got them classes of different varieties and stuff because 
Yeah. Also, like watching kids open gifts like this is not just specific to my family, but having been to different birthday parties and stuff, this whole premise of like not letting the kids slow down to be interested in the thing that that just got that. Yeah, they got another gift. You got to open the next gift and open the next gift. It's like, sure, they'll find one of those gifts that they really appreciate. Um, But like that means everything else is just kind of thrown through the window and it's just background noise rather than letting them get excited, excited or disappointed about one specific specific thing and like i think i'm trailing off a little bit so i'm gonna stop talking um i guess i had one more uh thing to say about giving gifts for kids is my brother and sister-in-law have done a very i think cool thing because they they have everything they need for their kid and my my parents spoil the crap out of that kiddo um and so something that they've done because he's also not even two yet um so for him, he doesn't, again, like you said, like they're just, you know, if he's opening gift after gift, he doesn't have time to appreciate them. And like, he might not even pick up that gift again. Um, so what my brother and sister-in-law have done is said, hey, if you want to contribute a gift to um, our kiddo, we've set up a fund for his college. We're starting that already. If you want to do something monetary, if that's like what your deal is, you... Like you can contrib- contribute to that. And that's like something that's contributing to his future. But like he's two, he's not going to remember every gift that he opens now. Um, but he might appreciate that. And it's a very practical thing for him for the future. So yeah. Doesn't feel as fun maybe as giving a, a gift, but like, it's much more practical. <laughs> if I was young, you're like, don't worry, little nephew or niece. I got you a gift for your, uh, for your future college. I'm like, oh, I wanted <laughs> Pokemon cards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kids love oh sorry no i'm not gonna say that the joke okay <laughs> no jokes and sincerity are mm-hmm. so you're gonna say lot. something i think play is sincere oh, okay oh, yeah <laughs> okay um i i do feel like we could go with this for hours but i wonder if we should do our little like closing round here so we can actually play our scheduled game yeah that works for everyone mm-hmm. uh yeah so so the third round is just similar to the first we'll just each do one like quick closing thought is that it yes yeah i guess oh well well, i just got put up on screen i guess i'll go yeah um (laughs) yeah so my closing thought is that um i believe it is the case that humans likely gathered in ceremonial or ritual ways around this time of year at least those living up in the north and for good reason and that is a long-standing history and that uh it doesn't always make sense to throw out all history when we get into the new and fandangled and although what this time of year has become presently as a consequence of the sort of like the like the hold that the capitalist consumer market has on the minds and behaviors of its uh its um its uh person's domain and what like the the sort of grossness that christmas has become from that material standpoint that not to like throw the baby out with the bath water and like lose the opportunity like lose the recognition that this is actually a very special important time of year in the sort of arc of seasons in the northern hemisphere um and to at the very least as as kelly was pointing to try to find things that are meaningful um and ceremonial to to me me trying to find that feels like an important act that I'm making and it's not to replace Christmas it's to find myself in this time of year with others in ways that hold me and them in it in meaningful ways yeah I'm gonna agree with that that's um I guess kind of the conclusion I'm coming to as well with the um what I was saying about learning to love Christmas again is learning to love it in a new way that is free of guilt and um obligation for gift giving um and more feels more natural and intuitive and more focused on um you know family quality time and all those things that we're actually going to remember and that the kids are actually going to remember
Yeah, I kind of have similar thoughts along the same lines. I think people don't have enough community in your life, in their life. If you can build that with your family, that is a, a really good place to do that. Christmas can totally be that. That is a large aspect of it and probably the most positive aspect of it is just spending time with people that you have history with, that you care about, and that you like. Uh, yeah, those relationships are invaluable. You you should not take them for granted. Even with the bad parts, I think it is still worth it. And if you can improve upon the bad parts, it will be even more worth it. I don't think I can say anything that hasn't been said already, but... Yeah, I think the kind of way I would summarize it is that um, as with so many things, like nothing, especially something that's kind of maybe fraught or complicated, needs to be exactly the way it is. So you can strip it down to like, well, what is the essential? Like, what is the what is the kernel of like the thing that I is valuable in this? And you can rebuild outward from there. And there's a lot you can draw from to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that our generation is going to be like leading the charge on that. Just talking to you four, I'm like, okay, cool. So other people have these same ideas. Um, and I'm hopeful that we can like cast off all that bullshit. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. Wow. That was fun I, to be sincere. I oh, want to, I want to point out just like from an experience standpoint, like we kind of like just jumped in that did a little eh, for what 25 minutes or something. Um, and you probably had the sense of like, whoa, this could actually go very deep. You know, like if you if we look at how deep we went in only a short amount of time on a singular question, um, the opportunity to go even deeper remains with the right amount of time frame. So if if, for example, a cafe if anyone is going to go from here to try it out at home you know setting something close to like a 90 minute mark and it's contained it's not like it just goes on and on everyone knows it's 90 minutes and somebody's tracking the time at what point do we stop the discussion round to have closing thoughts it's incredible how deep and focused it can go and i think we all just got a little taste of that literally just on the surface of what was possible in that conversation with just that single question Right, that one question just unfolds. Um, so, yeah, that was great. I appreciate you, uh, y'all, bringing that in for Sincerity Hour. I would like to just jump in and do the most jarring uh, tonal shift of all time, because like, let's let's just get into the game and see how we do with it. Uh, so, why don't we just uh, get straight into it? Um, I'll have you all introduce your characters briefly. And then I'll kind of give the preamble. So the prompt that I gave everyone is that uh, each of you is going to be uh, sort of an archetype of a person you you meet at seemingly every music festival or something along those lines. And all of you have varying levels of experience of that kind of culture. So I'm curious to see what you all came up with. Wow, I did not get that prompt. I just came up with something off the cuff. But you can pretend like I thought this was an archetype of somebody <laughs> Who I met at the met at a music festival. I think it fits. I think it fits. I mean, you can you can adapt it if you want, like a minute. Like, no, no, no that's <laughs> I definitely okay. we'll sent you the prompt, but we can whatever we'll you want to be. We'll just go with it. I I put it together last minute. I it feels very disrespectful of the offer to be on your show to do that last mm -hmm. minute. I also don't even have my character sheet. I did it online. I didn't know I had to save it. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, who would do their character sheet last minute? That's so disrespectful. Or Definitely. write the game last minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I guess I'll go first. Um, so my character's name is Smokey. Uh, my friends call me De Bear. Uh, it's like an inside joke. Uh, you can just call me Smokey, though. It's fine. Um, I am average height, size, build, and looks. Um, I'm wearing a hoodie and pajama pants. Um, both have cannabis leaves printed on them. Um, my hair is lank and unwashed under my beanie. Um, for my background, um, I've been to Sham like five times, Space Coast like three times, uh, Fozzie and Astral like two or three times. 
Uh, I went to five different festivals this year. Wicked Woods was like probably the best, but it was like so fucking cold, man. Um, I had like a great time though. Like, you know, the beats are just like, like the whole time is great. Uh, my, um, do I, do you want me to tell you what I'm good at and what I'm bad at as well? The whole sheet? No, we can come up with that as we roll. Okay. Um, I guess for my unique talent, talent, I can talk for 45 minutes interrupted without a response from the other person in the conversation, which causes their eyes to glaze, glaze over um, and temporarily lowers their like perception. So like maybe we could do some like sneaky t- things in that time period. Um, and uh, yeah, in my inventory, I have a, a pocket full of floor pills. So Perfect. Did you test them or are you purely winging it? No, bro. It's like, it's, it's fine. Like I'm ground sure scores. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This one, they, they look, I think they look like what I think they are. So like, just, just try them out, you know? I feel like honestly, who tests their drugs anymore anyways, right? Cause it's like, I'm not there to test my drugs. I'm there to take my drugs. Okay. Yeah. I'll test them when I put them in my mouth. Am I right? That's the that's the surest way to test them for sure. <laughs> as a public figure, uh, as a public figure speaking on uh, responsible psychedelic use, I stand behind this. Don't test them, <laughs> just take them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, geez, I hope people knew that I was joking there. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry. We'll clip out the context and. Oh, please, are you you're tweeting right now, right? You're live tweeting this. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so this character you've come up with, I feel like, uh, I feel like honestly, you could change a couple key words, and like th- this is somebody you've seen at a festival. You know, I mean, like, it's pretty uh, close. It's pretty close. The the appearance for sure. Well, do you, do you want to me go? to do you want me to introduce myself then? Yeah. Do I do I say my background as well, just or my name, just appearance and background? Yeah, do your name and appearance, and uh, if you. Uh, if you want to make the background a little more festival, you can, but uh, no pressure. Read it incredibly monotone without any inflection. Jesus. Just joking. <clears throat> don't do that. <laughs> Anyways, I, I don't know how I'll change my background. I really went out on the edge. I was like, yeah, last time it was crazy. I'll just go crazy. Uh, so my name is Shrivel, Shrivel T, which is a nickname. Um <laughs> My appearance, I am tall and emaciated, mostly skin and bone, seemingly already dead and decomposed for at least three years, long beard and hair, (laughs) both very gray, nails oddly reminiscent of the vampire in 1922's Nosferatu, yet somehow still attractive (laughs) in a very smart looking jumpsuit. Um, Anyways, my my background, maybe you guys can help me change it. Uh, Once a hipster on the scene way back in the day, uh, Shrivel T, myself, was exposed to a tragic chemical accident involving 13 tractor trailers, a helicopter, and one of those cat cafe or one of those cafes where there are cats all over the place. And my mm-hmm. grossly deformed figure is a consequence of that accident, likely due to the mix of caffeine in my bloodstream and cat and dander present on my skin at the time of the accident. Um, so, <laughs> can, so I, can I throw we'll... out a quick spin on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. please. Once a hippie on the scene way back in the day, um, but also still on the scene because he's just an older guy who's never quite gone away. Uh, Shrivelty was exposed to a tragic chemical accident uh, involving a festival porta potty tipping over. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, no. his, uh, his grossly, you know, deformed self since then is a, is a consequence of uh, that accent, likely due to the mix of all of the things that were in people's body waste, uh, as well as the stuff that was just in his system for years. Wow, a perfect confluence Beautiful. of internal and external forces meeting and crystallizing into the glory that is shrivelty. You have every available disease simultaneously. <laughs> Thanks, porta potty. <laughs> all right. So, um, this story is a uh, it's a continuation in a world that we've already been in, but I'm going to do the little preamble. Should I introduce myself? Oh, you haven't done you. I have Sorry, not. Go ahead. Uh, I am fi- 36, 5 foot 7, quite lean and slightly muscled as I do yoga and dance all night at the 250 plus festivals that I have attended. 
I have a <laughs> intricately shaved mandala in the side of my closely cropped dark brown hair. I have extremely dark skin and some very questionable looking sunspots that are very likely some sort of long-term skin damage. <laughs> I wear nothing but a, uh, a poncho, a rice hat, and a boda bag. Uh, I also have a Prince Albert penis piercing uh, that I got at the peak of an acid trip at a festival because I felt that it was my destiny. It was the best way to self-actualize in the moment. Uh, I am from Croatia. I was uh, brought up in poverty. I moved around. My mother died at a very young age, and I quit my poorly paying retail job to attend a trance festival and at the age of 23 and have been festivaling for 15 years since chasing festivals around the world to Australia and South America and the Pacific Northwest, never quite finding enlightenment, but always riding the enlightenment high, or at least what I deem to be. Yes. That is my, uh, also, I don't speak Croatian anymore and I don't have a Croatian accent from, <laughs> uh, as a result of so much time spent abroad. Okay. Quick clarification. You said you're wearing nothing but a poncho and a rice yeah. hat and a bag. So you're just doll yeah. ducking it with your oh yeah bolted cock hanging I out. I did see a guy at a festival like this poncho and it was cocking. incredible. It was a beautiful <laughs> sight. Serious question though, like, have you continued to stretch your Prince Albert as a way of sort of like just having a brief moment like gauging of touching it? That and no, I mean like, yeah, gauging it. I think you said aging, yeah, gauging it. Like, yeah, it's uh probably like a four gauge at this point, so like quite thick, not like not like a a large hole, but definitely a larger hole than normal. Like large enough that you got to sit down to pee every time, or it's just a mess. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Certainly. Yeah. It is taking up the entirety of my urethra as it comes <laughs> out the end. Certainly. Flawless. Beautiful. All right. And we're in a cold open here before we get the opening credits. You find yourselves, all of you, sitting around a camp at a festival. A man named Bearcat has excitedly gathered you to insufflate copious amounts of drugs. He instructs his partner, or sweaty snuggle buddy as he calls her, her name is Powder Puff, to dole them out, and she presents a mirror with four white lines of powder on it. From left to right, she presents them as blow, special K, cake, and she pauses before guessing, also blow? So why, why don't we get a quick sense of how each of you came to the exact same camp? What, what, what were the, what's the one sentence in explanation of how you ended up in Bearcat's camp? I have been wandering around for hours with the short-term memory of a goldfish. Approximately 15 seconds is the maximum amount of time I can keep in my mind at any given moment. So I just stumbled into their camp and sat. Um, I, wait, what day is it in this? Is it, is this the Friday, the Saturday, or the Sunday? Ooh, good question. Uh, here, we're going to roll a d4 for that. Okay. Also, what time of day is it? Uh, I got a two, so I was going to say it's Friday. And uh, let's uh, let's roll for hours past noon. Hmm. Oh, can we throw that dice cam on? Yeah, it's it's midnight. Okay. Am I... Wait, midnight, so midnight coming okay, into Saturday it is, morning? It is several minutes to midnight on Friday. Okay. Okay. Um, and I, I'm like, oh, more like Friday, am I right? Um, I've been just like getting high all day, like smoking some J's. And I like, like the kids in Hansel and Gretel, I like saw this like cookie cum trail of like what looked like floor, floor drugs um, or like ground scores, um, whatever you want to call them. And I followed them back to their camp. I was like picking up these drugs as they drop them and followed them back to their camp that way that is how i found them 
Uh, so for myself, I don't know if it's time for this to come out, but as a consequence of this horrendous and yet somehow uh, like life renewing accident that I had with this porta potty, I developed a sort of capacity. Um, and uh, in that capacity, I, well, I'm not going to reveal it yet, but let's just say I utilize that as I often do, especially on Friday nights in the effort to try to find some people that could give me free drugs. And I had the sense that lines were being doled out. So I landed in that particular, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that particular camp, um, nose, nose out and ready. A common occurrence. Some stranger just appears in next to the communal joint or et cetera. You don't know their name. Nobody knows them, but they fit right in. <laughs> All right. So um, Powder Puff is basically offering um, this mirror towards you, saying, like, yeah, pick one. Take it. Well, do we have to pick just one, man? Or can I, like, do all four? Um, she, she goes, ah, like, why don't you start with one? Because there's, there's three of you. And I just think uh, let's well, let's go one each, and then maybe maybe you can have the mystery line if you want the other one. I mean, I'll well, just take it now. I'll I'm take... I'm <laughs> jumping in. Sorry, you're, you're just taking too long. I mean, like you've had too many <laughs> joints. I just got to get in there. I I know which one <laughs> I want. I want the cake because you know since the accident, things are just kind of strange. And if I don't mix it up, then I just feel like it's not really working for me because everything is happening all the time because of this whole thing that's got going on in my inside since the thing came on me. So I would just like to hit it up now. Plus, I haven't had a line in like at least five minutes. I gotta I gotta like get back up in there if you know what I mean. So I'll take mm -hmm. the cake. Totally, bro. It's all, right. all you. That takes the cake. <laughs> and that was so. Your name is sh like Shrivly. Shrivly, Shrivly, like. Okay, so Shrivly took the third line, which was identified as cake. Shrivly surely knows what that means. Shrivly does. Shrivly's calming down a bit, but also is now also extra alert. Well, hold that thought. So. <laughs> okay. Uh. So I believe. Uh, Smokey was kind of the next person who was like at jumping at the bit here. Yeah, I'm like, I feel like I just needed to chill out a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna take the K because, like, I just like I'm feeling a little anxious, you know. So, like, I'll uh, I'll, I'll take that line number two there. Line number two, okay, powder, 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 powder puff. Yeah, so you're gonna take line number two. Oh my god, Powder Puff, I just got that cuz you're like doling out powders. Oh yeah, you know, they're they're clever around here. Oh shit, that's so good. All right. Uh well there are uh, two lines left. Uh so you are uh, Ivan uh which would be how they pronounce it in Croatia. Unless Yvonne. you've anglicized it to Ivan. No, it's Ivan. Okay. Um I'm definitely going to uh stare at Powder Puff for an uncomfortable amount of time and then abruptly snort the fourth line because I'm line. adventurous. I want the mystery blow. Cuz there's a chance it's not one of these boring drugs. All it's right. something cooler. And Powder Puff goes, "Cool. Well, if you guys don't mind, maybe I'll have the first line cuz this one is blow cuz it's on the Wait, and then she kind of takes her hands up and does the left right thing. And she's like, let my 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 left. And as she's trying to figure that out, uh, she's she's kind of puzzling over these lines. Uh Bearcat comes back with the containers of drugs that Powder Puff never grabbed, mm. marked with red, blue, green, and pink tape. He asks her why she didn't give them out yet, and she explains that she did showing him the containers she used, with our, which are marked with red, blue, green, and pink tape. Slowly, he realizes with creeping horror the mistake she's made. Sweaty snuggle, buddy, he says. You were dispensing from the maroon, navy, forest, and magenta ones. She stares at him blankly. He continues, you were supposed to get out the scarlet, aqua, lime, and lavender ones. After an awkward pause, he adds, it's fine, just scoop it all back on the right container and put this stuff on the mirror for our friends here extending his supply to her and gesturing toward all of you collectively. So he he's, he thinks you haven't taken anything yet. Oh, I don't know if I'm like 
super high or what, but I thought that I already took it, but like maybe this guy is right. Did we does anyone else remember if we took the drugs already? Uh, I definitely didn't take any drugs and would certainly need another, thank you. Oh, I certainly yeah. can I mean I mean my remember. first one. <laughs> so uh well that last one is on the mirror. Is anybody gonna like just go to snatch it or it seems apparent that she didn't give you the line she thought she did. All right, no takers. So she pulls it away and he starts going, oh shit, okay, so you took, and he looks at the uh, containers that she did pour out. So, uh, Smokey, what you have taken a big fat line of is 2CD. Nice. And uh, so uh, each of you, depending on which substance you took, uh, you are actually going to uh, gain an extra uh, skill and an extra weakness. So if you already have the skill or weakness, there's no effect. So like I already obviously know what 2CD is because I've been to Sham five times. But like if you could explain it to my peeps here that we just did the lines with, that'd be sick. Uh, yeah, we'll get to that. So the 2CD in... in <laughs> okay. The practical effects you have gained, you've gotten better at resilience if you're not already good at that. And oh, you, you're now, you're, you were now good at resilience and bad at agility. Um, oh, I was already those things. Really? Yes. Okay. <laughs> no change. <laughs> Do you want to make me doubly good at resist resilience and doubly bad at agility? Uh, I don't know how we would do that. Um, we'll come, we'll come back to that. Uh, so next, uh, Shrivelly, you've taken 2CE, a big fat line of it, and, uh, this has made you good at stealth, but bad at intimidation. Sneaky. Okay, well, I was, I was good at intimidation before. So um, that just cancels out. You're normal at intimidation. Okay, okay. Uh, but I am now also good at stealth. Yep. Which so is you good, note that. which is really good because, um... I'm going to be seeing a whole lot of things right now. And uh, if people didn't see me, that would, <laughs> that would be helpful. I, who knows what I'm about to get, get up to. <laughs> That's right. And finally, we have Yvonne, who has taken 2CI. Uh, this is making you, made you good at persuasion, but bad at speed. Hmm. And Smokey was in the process of trying to ask, well, what exactly is this substance I've taken? Uh, and you start getting an answer, but it's not too long before you can't really parse people's answers. And this is an experience that's kind of happening to all of you simultaneously. While you all begin to panic, reality begins to break apart. Colors swirl like tracers, intensifying as music amps up in the background. The drop of the music coincides with a pulling back of perspective in which your viewpoint withdraws from your physical form like an out-of-body experience, zooming out in both space and time in a manner that shows you that everything you've ever experienced in this life, past, present, even future, was just one arc on an infinite repeating metaphysical sine wave. And as you pull back that space, pull back, that space-time shrinks to a manageable size, a little fragment of reality and a fractal of infinitely nested realities. As that small reality collapses into a single point, you experience this profound deja vu as you find yourself experiencing another lifetime, every bit as long and as real as the one you just lived, the only one you thought you'd ever had, but somehow also condense into a manageable, perceivable stretch of time from this new vantage point. This pattern repeats, and you realize that you've been living slight variations of the same life for eternity, and yet, you also sense that each loop is occurring and collapsing slightly faster and more intensely each time culminating uh in your death in a sense of collapse and this goes on for infinity loops until finally the pulling back experience uh pulls back from a collapsed reality into an ineffable purple void the various realities being little tears along the courses of big long electric streaks of biochemical pink lightning as they shrink and snap shut Finally, the recursion seems to pass, and you find your completely disembodied selves adrift in this endless expanse, feeling spiritually like desiccated carcasses lying in the desert sand being picked at by carry-on. So you're now disembodied presences in a purple void. 
Mm. Shit, dude, that was fucking. Oh no, wild. you can't speak. You're disembodied. Oh. Can I thank it at everyone? No, you can just perceive. I feel the bird peck at my flesh. Yeah, you definitely feel that. Uh, yeah. So mostly, what you can do is wait. Do you want to do a short wait, a long wait, or an infinite wait? How long do I have to wait for it to be 420? An infinite wait, probably. Okay, I'll do an infinite wait. All right, after an infinite wait, we now are, uh, that's our opening bit. We've now cut to the credits, you know, Star Trek style. And uh, let's, let's get filled in in the backstory here. Mm. Hopefully everybody uh, followed that perfectly. Got it. Last time in the Holiday Zone, we followed the 2017 exploits of two intrepid heroes, Courtney, better known as Starseed Child of the Indigo Knight, and Brad, who loved techno. The unlikely duo accidentally stumbled their way into a featureless white void, where they were greeted by a foppish dandy calling himself the Prince of Christmas and explained with great urgency that Christmas was in peril. He presented them with three keys that matched obviously to three respective doors, which they obviously took to be a puzzle and spent 20 minutes agonizing over how to proceed. In the first door, they encountered an evil spirit in a dark robe who identified himself as Antipope Constantine and who was torturing Santa. In their attempts to rescue Santa, they accidentally crippled him profoundly. They then did a passable job of corralling and curing wayward reindeer, including Chet, the worst reindeer, before becoming exhausted at the prospect of sorting out an elf strike, and Starseed set herself on fire. The two found themselves back in reality, and the course of Christmas was altered forever. Now, and oh, we have to roll for what year it is. 2014, so this is a prequel. Sorry, was that a two? 2012. We've flipped back into 2012. Now in 2012, the extra-dimensional forces of the holidays are at work again. So, you're all floating in this void, but eventually something seems to happen. Less than being adrift, you find your disembodied selves being pulled in a direction, and the more you're pulled, the more this featureless purple void seems to have some elements of structure. You can't discern it visually, but there seems to be a definite ground, and as you alight on it, you have a sense of your arms and legs again. Uh, and if you look at your own bodies, Smokey, you will notice you're now a very like stereotypical like fantasy dwarf. And uh, Shrively, you're sort of like a classic uh, elf. And uh, Ivan, or Yvonne, more of a wizard. Hmm. And... Do I have a cool hat? Absolutely you do. Describe your cool hat. My cool hat is purple, just like the void we were just in. Uh, the brim is approximately three feet wide, uh, and the top is about two feet tall, and it bends quite seriously to the right. Does anybody else want to describe their new look? Uh, no, but I would like to check my pockets and make sure that I still have my floor drugs. <laughs> so, all right. So here's how um, the inventory is going to work. So there'll be a thing coming in the story that'll allow you to pick something. Um, if you've written stuff in your inventory already, tell me one thing that you have on you. Or you can save it for later if you want to like decide later. I have a fanny pack. It Beautiful. matches my jumpsuit, which uh, remains. It's a very what color. Is your jumpsuit? jumpsuit? It's black. It's, it's of course black. It's a I'm sort of like post psychedelic. You know, I was color, and then now it's all black. Hmm. I just trip so hard eventually after the whole porta potty thing that I eventually <laughs> realize that uh, the infinite void is nothingness and blackness, and I wanted to <laughs> I wanted to be an expression of my uh, of the enlightenment that I tasted as the porta potty chemicals <laughs> drizzled into my various open orifices. <laughs> <laughs> tasted like enlightenment. Uh... <laughs> Good lord. <laughs> All right. Are you keeping your inventory a secret there, Yvonne, or do you have something on you? I have nothing in my inventory. All right. So uh, you also notice now that the void is starting to look almost like a physical environment, 
you notice a very real physical looking hatch on the ground. And uh, each of you can decide this for your own, but in your head, you hear the voice of the last person that you you heard speaking in the old reality. If it was Bearcat, you just hear the vo- word hurry over and over. But if it was Powder Puff, you hear the word safety over and over. Mm. And you are now able to move. Okay. Do, does it matter who I'm hearing? Do I have to tell you guys? Uh, I think that's a little bit of headcanon just for yourself. A little treat for you. Okay. Cool. I'm going to stumble towards the voice. Wait, is it, uh, the, the, sorry, the voice coming from the hatch? Yeah. Okay. I, it kind of, it kind of seems like we should go in this hatch. Does anyone else feel that way? And I, I just start opening it without waiting for a reply. Cool. As you open the hatch, uh, you feel a gravitational pull pulling you in and it pulls your companions along behind you. As you hop down through the hatch, you fly through a long tunnel, accelerate faster than you ever thought possible, like a sudden roller coaster drop to the nth degree. The next thing you know, you're just sitting there in a camp chair, like a festival camp chair, in a concrete bunker. Mm. Is there anything else in this bunker? And is it lit? Yeah. Uh, looking yeah, around. It's lit you're... as hell, bro. It's oh, fucking it's so sick. Lit. You can see that same hatch above you. You can see it opens to a purple expanse, but it's slowly coming closed. And uh, you're kind of in like a recessed area of this bunker. You know, it's, it seems almost like a landing zone. There's these little chairs there. There's some little like nice rugs and tapestries. And uh, kind of at the end of this recess, you can see what looks like a giant like futuristic command center. Uh, just all these like, incredibly futuristic displays glowing computer terminals and there's a hooded figure walking toward you i would like to sit down i mean it's been an infinite time since i've had a body and for whatever reason still i just feel really tired <laughs> and so i just uh i just want to sit down in one of those chairs I, I if this guy's already coming towards me this hooded figure then i'll just i'll just wait and let it let them arrive yeah yeah you're sitting you're comfortable uh, and the hooded figure uh, comes closer to you, and he says, "Privyet, uh, Hey, bro. I don't know if you know this, but I don't think you're speaking English. Hmm. I pretend to understand him, uh, and walk up to him and uh, try to shake his hand. Uh, okay, so if you go up to shake his hand, um, your hand is kind of like, his sleeve just kind of slides over your hand and your hand vanishes, Hmm. and you feel just like the iciest feeling shoot through all of your veins, and you just feel like the coldest, most deathly sense you've ever had. It's comforting in a way, but it feels like death. Can I try and hug him? (laughs) <laughs> yeah um i think honestly he's just taken aback by that and uh lets you hug him and it just like he feels fairly corporeal like are you kind of doing that like because you're handshaking you're doing that kind of like wrap around bro. Yeah, hug yeah with so one it, arm still in his sleeve i am going to try and hug him with my other arm yeah so you kind of take him by surprise and uh you get the hug he fa- feels fairly corporeal like in a way that as you would expect and like he feels like cool to the touch through the robe, but mm. through that hand that's shaking his, and it does feel like a hand, it's just iciness coursing through your body until you almost have to pull back mm. from uh, that near frostbite. And he kind of like cocks his robe at you quizzically and says, like, uh. now, To be clear, you said you forgot Croatian? Yeah. Okay, so you don't recognize that sentence, which is like identical in Croatian. <laughs> So, like, I looked did it you, up. Did was did you say brewskis? Because like it's about time, I think. Because you you got do you have beers down here? Is that what you're offering us, man? The road figure kind of puts his like sleeve to his head in like a a weird approximation of a head scratching motion. Says, "Vigovaritje English, yes, yes, English, yes." Ah, bleat is Sorry, fuck. 
I already f always forget. I forget. Uh, English still big deal in Earthly Realm is no problem. We'll speak English. My bad. Oh, thank God, man. I just thought I was way too fucking high. Well, I tell you, you are way too high, but that, you know, we don't have time to explain. <laughs> I'm just grateful that I've had this time to take a little rest because uh, while the two of you engaged, I had an opportunity to sit back and assess the situation from the comfortable, what do you say, lawn furniture chairs? <laughs> Yeah, I like festival chairs. Like folding chairs. Yeah. So my low back doesn't feel great, but my legs are feeling very rested. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely correct. So uh, seeing you all just kind of staring, the anti-pope understands maybe he's got to just, he's got to hold your hand a bit. It's okay, so I brought you here today because I'm very busy, man. People to see, things to do. You three in particular, worst vibes of whole festival. I have to say, really am impressed. Each of you, absolute black hole of vibes. Please, I must stress, take this as compliment. Is what makes you best suited for job. What needs to be done? What, what do you need us to, to be do? done? Yeah. Yes. Fuck, bro. I had like an indica earlier, and I don't know if I'm going to be good to do much. I... Indica couch, you should probably take a seat. If I, yeah, bro. If I would known we were supposed to be doing shit, I would have done a sativa. Uh, will we be paid for this gig, and will that payment be in more drugs? <laughs> oh yes, if you if you are successful, I can pay you in all earthly manner. If you succeed on mission, I can take you over to command center. We have uh, three missions available. I'm into more drugs. Let's do it. Okay, so you follow him, and he. So you, you follow him to the larger room and you see the vast network of advanced technology is far larger than it appeared from your limited viewpoint in the entryway. There's a giant hollow globe that shows the earth that you know. And uh, who's, uh, do you want to, why don't you all roll me two dice or does anybody need? Okay, so let's do, let's do uh, Smokey first. Uh, roll both sets. And then the, of the pairs, the worst one is what she got. Okay, that's a six. What would it be, you good or bad? Good. All right, so roll them both and keep the better number. All right, you got an eight, and uh, we're going to roll for you too? Five. All right, none of you notice anything interesting about it. And, or sorry, when you rolled an eight? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, that was you? Yes. So you notice on this globe that there are uh, there's a marker for where this festival was, uh, in uh, let's say it was in Canada, and uh, but then this, an assistant switches the map and there's this totally imperceptible map. It's inscrutable. You can't follow it. It just says Christmas Dimension under it. Hmm. There's three markers on it in disparate locations. Okay, welcome to our command center from which we plan and execute strategies in support of eternal war for Christmas. While church proper does most uh, direct confrontation, negotiation, diplomacy with other factions, from this clandestine division we take part in more precise, less visible operation. I am head of this division called Extra Legal Christmas Command or Xmascom for short. Uh, it's well kept secret even from most members of church itself. Hmm. How long have you existed for? Oh, I am uh, eternal and immortal. Uh, the thing is, as time passes in Christmas dimension, it is same as in your world. It maps directly, you know? It's, uh, it is what you call 2012. But uh, the time in here matters exactly as much as it does in your world, which is to say not at all, but it's far easier for you to understand. Does this mean Santa Claus is real? Santa Claus is a decadent American creation. He is uh, he is part of Worst Christmas Faction, one's in charge right now, and it is in part of our sacred goal. Uh, as uh, I am, I don't know if I told you, I am associate of Eastern Orthodox Church uh, to uh, reclaim the spirit of Christmas to its uh, you know its proper owners, which is us. Any more questions, or do you want to see your missions? I want to see my mission. I want to see what's up here. 
I'm ready okay. to go. I'm ready to make this happen. Yes. We've got the uh, three options, and uh, each one is going to target different uh, faction we have problems with in uh, Christmas Dimension. So first option is uh, to sabotage the boat of Sinterklaas, which is, of course, Dutch Santa Claus, uh, most racist Santa Claus with, uh, with his little racist subordinates. And uh, yeah, uh, this Sinterklaas, he's an imposter of St. Nikolai. Do not believe his lies. He claims to bring toys and money for children, but always just leave shoe polish for doing blackface. Uh, it's time to strike forceful blow to the heart of decadent Western European racism. Option two, uh, kidnap the Queen of Christmas. Uh, it, uh, oh, and sorry, first uh, option, medium difficulty. This one, hard difficulty. The Prince of Christmas's continued acts of terrorism in ethereal plane have gone on for too long. This aggression cannot stand. He is crafty and careful, but his mother, decadent and complacent. She is best target for kidnapping attempts. And of course, finally, option three, sacrifice the Yule Goat. It is easy. Goat is uh, tethered, unsupervised. Gain access, cut throat, make sure he's dead. Very simple. No more decadent goat nonsense. Why? Why do you care about the goat? Listen, there's no time to explain. You just have to understand that uh, these, all of these other groups, they're trying to take away Christmas from you and ruin it. Uh, and uh, we, as uh, forces of evil, have to stop them. Why should I care about Eastern Orthodox Christmas? Ah, well, it's very simple. It's, uh, you know, we are one true church, as you know, and all of these other forces, they are corrupt and decadent. And, uh, you know, bottom line is... Uh, we we need your help. If we don't uh, regain a little uh, power of spirit of Christmas, we do not have power to send you back to your world and you are trapped here forever in featureless purple void. Mm. <laughs> I'll take the goat. Uh, you are you just kind of like reach out and like just be like, yeah, this is what I'm doing? Or are you going to confer with your teammates here? No, I'm going to reach out. I, I just feel like I, I feel called, like I could do this. I could get this done. All right, so you reach out and uh, you you press a button and all of you are pulled into this like holographic map. Well, wait, all of us are going. We're not each yep. getting a separate mission. No, you're uh, you're all uh, you're all you're all in this together. Wow, you you team, hear it as you kind of get sucked in. I didn't know, in. team. I didn't know. <laughs> as you get sucked into this map, it's you kind of cool, hear the bro. fading you voice. You said it was the easiest one, so like I'm cool with it. The robed figure, uh, you hear his voice trailing off. You're all in these two gears, sir. And uh, yeah, you don't see him anymore. You you find yourself uh, in a like a waiting area. It's almost like a little like military esque dropship. And you see an equipment locker in front of you, and there's uh, another hooded figure next to you, uh, a lot more like feminine than the first one. It's kind of like when she speaks, it pierces you with the most ethereal, beautiful voice you've ever heard which is in stark contrast to that guy's like gravelly, like phlegmy voice. And she goes, yes, hello. We will be landing in uh, five minutes. Uh, you have <laughs> they, options. They sound exactly the same to me, but. Yes. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's theater of the mind, you know? <laughs> and uh, she says, okay, I give you a quick rundown. We have, uh, we have some equipment here. We have a portal gun. We have bolt cutters. We have invisibility cloak. We have a sack of smoke bombs. We have a poison inked pen, and we have fifty feet of hemp and rope. How does the portal gun work? Is it like portal game portal? It is exactly like video game portal. You have blue portal and the orange portal. Do I have to search for very specific walls that I can shoot the portal onto? You know, it's probably going to be uh, very favorable once you get into it. Okay. Do we each get a device, or do we have to collect? Yes, all pick one device. Did you say one of them is like a hemp rope? Yep. I, I like you know hemp is the material of the future, so I'm taking that. Cool. So that is now your second inventory item. I will go with the poison inked pen. Is that right. what it was? Poison inked yep. pen. I picked the portal gun. All right, you pick the portal gun. Uh, why don't you roll those red dice? That's how many to total portals you can shoot. Seven. 
Okay, so you guys have chosen sacrifice the y Yule Goat. You find yourself adjoining a very dark farm, the area lit only by the faint glow of the mildly shimmering portal you entered through. Beyond the fence in front of you, about 100 meters away, you see the lights on some of the farm buildings. In all other directions, you see thick, impenetrable woodland. In the farmer's field, there is a small barn to the right, an outhouse in the middle, and a grain silo to the left. Past it all is a cozy-looking farmhouse with all of its lights on. Between you and the buildings, there are many large hay bales, conveniently a quick dash away from each other, distributed evenly, distributed evenly across the area in a staggered grid. Can I jump onto the hay bale, shoot a portal at the barn door, the barn side, and then one onto the ground, and then jump through the portal? Uh, yeah, you do that, and it pops you out uh, directly next to the barn, um, about like 100 meters ahead of your uh, co companions here. Am I able to, to like run like a, in a quick dash to catch up? Yeah. Um, you, you start running. Are you running straight toward him or are you kind of like ducking and weaving behind the hay bales? Uh, I'm ducking and weaving. All right. But, and Smokey can do anything? Uh, yeah, actually before these guys get away from me, am I able to like tie my rope to one of them so that they could just drag me? Oh, are you going to try to like lasso and water ski off one of them? I mean, I wouldn't say lasso, but I'm probably going to be like, hey, guys, can I like just hitch a ride? Is that cool? And try. But you want to do this before they take off? Yeah. Is that OK? I think they've already taken off. Oh, OK. I'm just going to stumble slowly after them then. OK, because you could probably try to lasso uh, Yvonne here. He's just or sorry. No, you could try to lasso uh, Shrivelly. That sounds running. like that sounds like a lot of work. I'll just catch up. Right. I, I just know I don't know how to tie a knot. I just I'll just walk. <laughs> okay, so you're standing. So Yvonne, you're standing next to the barn, mm -hmm. and uh, you hear uh, you hear some chatter from down near the end of the house, going, "Hey, what's what's that glow?" Can I get rid of the portal? Uh, yeah, I feel like you can just do that. Cool. I'm going to get rid of the portal. All right. And then they go, oh, must have been the wind. <laughs> the wind glows. Yes. Um, I'm Wait. going to. Sorry, go ahead. Can I have just walked through that portal? Probably. Uh, well, if you're it's too late. If it's you're watching now, through the <laughs> if you're watching through the ground portal, now you just see uh, which which one is still there, the orange one or the blue one? Uh, so it'll be the. Let's say I fired the orange one at the barn wall and the blue one at the ground. Okay, so you're just looking at a big blue oval because he turned off his orange portal. Okay, well, never mind. Slow thinking again. Damn it, Smokey. Fuck. That's what happens. <laughs> um, right. I'm going to hide next to the barn and maybe like, is there is there a window nearby? Yeah, there's a window next to you. And if you peer into it, you see uh, a goat, very festive looking goat. It says festive vibes. Mm -hmm. And it's inside of this barn. It's tethered. It seems like there's some other motion in there. It's hard to tell. The window's kind of foggy. Cool. I'm going to wait for my uh, compatriots to catch up to me. Okay, you do that. Well, unfortunately, on my way there, thinking that I was more agile than I actually was, I tripped uh on one of those hay bells and actually just impaled myself uh oh, with no. this poison ink pen uh <laughs> what kind of poison is it is it an instantaneous kind of death or am i in for a difficult uh, couple of minutes here uh i would say that um you've got about two minutes of agony exactly okay, okay. And then you kind of will probably just shrivel. Uh, shrivel, -er, shrivel t er. Uh, okay. You feel like you have them. just enough strength uh, uh. to plug any sort of any sort of media properties you would want anyone with an earshot to check out. Uh, just <laughs> if if you make it through this, please just just tell people to check out James Jesso's Adventures of the Mind podcast. It's <laughs> It's pretty cool. I mean, most of the episodes anyways. Uh, it hurts so much. I wish this podcast was playing now to to serenade me on my way through. The intro music is really interesting. Uh, 
you hear one of the voices from the house area going, oh man, did someone say Adventure Through the Mind? That is, oh, I love that pod. It's so good. And it's on YouTube as well. It's really well produced. Uh, you can hear this really well as you die. Uh, I'm so happy to know somebody else likes something that I like. Uh... As as I walk by you, I, I give you a handful of my floor drugs so that you can decide if you want to use them to stanch your pain. Uh, I Sucks, reach, bro. I reach, but unfortunately, the, the poison is taking too hold. My muscles are contracting. Rigor mortis is setting in early, but I do my best to try to offer you the pen so that... Assuming there's any poison left, you now also have this item. I, I uh, thanks, bro. I don't need a pen, but I, I'll take my drugs back. And I, I collect my <laughs> drugs, <laughs> and I and I walk away. Thank, thanks, bro. Sorry, sorry about your death. Uh, have have a good have a good afterlife, I guess. Later, bro. And then suddenly, Shrivelly blinks out of existence, as though a camera was suddenly snapped off, and there was just darkness. <laughs> damn damn I'm, <laughs> right. glad, I'm glad i got that closure though how All far right. away is uh smoky from catching up to me uh i feel like uh she's about halfway across the field okay you guys get try to speed run the end of this adventure i could uh i could uh, give her a speed boost him a speed boost i'm gonna shoot a portal at the wall next to me mm -hmm. and then shoot a portal attempt to shoot a portal underneath smoky as they're walking <laughs> all right so i want to see how accurate you are here um so why don't you roll agility it's just going to be a normal die roll there uh no it's just two like it's uh you're rolling for yeah so you you get in the right general area so you sh you lead her a little bit as mm -hmm. she's walking and so it kind of have you ever kind of like missed the end of a, a step on your stairs? Yep. So she kind of has that with the edge of the portal and she tumbles through the portal, smokes her face on the other edge of it. And then kind of like, why they call me smoky bro. Smoke yeah. my face on everything. <laughs> yeah. And she kind of crumples uh, out of the, the vertical portal that you put on the barn door okay. at your feet. So and I've now shot four portals, correct? That sounds right. Okay. And I have seven. You've got three left. Did Smokey uh, damage their face in any way? I like... think Smokey should roll resilience here. What oh. are you good or bad at it? I am good at it. Um, can someone give me a roll? Yeah, do you want to roll both pairs for her? And we'll keep the better pair. I'm like... Eleven. <laughs> So Eleven yeah, is very good. I tumble, I tumble flawlessly out, and I go, "Whoa, bro!" That reminds me of the time at like, I think it was the second year at Sham, where I like fell into this hole, and I came out, and I was totally fine. Did I tell you guys that I went to Sham five times? That's a lot of times. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I got a bracelet for every time I've been there. Do you wear them? Do you put them on your wrist when you reattend the festival every year? Of course, bro. That's the only way to do it. You got the little hat with the owl thing on it. It's sick. Got it sick. in every color. All right. So <laughs> you are you are unharmed, I take it. And uh, it's kind of like, you know how when people uh, often like drunk drivers, like they'll kill the other people, but they won't die because they're all like loosened up. <laughs> mm hmm you basically are so stoned you didn't brace yourself and you just kind of flopped harmlessly to the ground. Beautiful. <laughs> Your face smarts a little from hitting the edge of the portal, but that's, you know, it's not it's not damage. Uh, you think my face is smart? That's the first time anyone's ever said that about me. That's real nice, uh, man. Yeah, and you feel genuinely good about that. <laughs> cool. All right, so you're both standing next to this barn. And uh, you, you kind of hear footsteps slowly approaching, almost as if uh, people are like kind of gradually coming in earshot. And they're like, oh, yeah, they're talking. They're talking about adventures of the mind out there. 
So I try to tell Smokey I have a plan. Actually, first, uh, in the barn, is there a flat roof? I would say it's a peaked roof. Okay. Is there, there's no flat surface above the goat? There's rafters. Well, okay. bro, if it's like a it's peak hollow. roof, why don't we just peek inside and see what we can do? Fair. You Can't do. argue with that. Okay. <laughs> why don't you, why don't you describe, uh, are you going to enact that plan? Why don't you describe how it manifests? Yeah, Yeah, totally. just peek on it there. Um, so I'm going to jump, um... Upwards, actually, can I get can I get a boost, bro? Yeah, I uh, put my hands out underneath the window to give her a boost. Okay. All hey. right. Good. So I want uteral strength. Oh, cool. And uh, I think that's going to be some agility for Smokey there. I am bad at agility. All right. Seven. So. This is your roll first? Yep. What did you get? Seven. Okay, not bad. Uh, and then roll both again for for Smokey here. And you're also going to take the bad number. Holy 11. shit, that's wow. the bad number? <laughs> yeah. That's pretty flawless. So you're, you're kind of struggling with it, and it feels like almost like you pull something as you lift her up, but you do successfully lift... Uh... Sorry, wait, what are your character... Are you, you What's your character's like pronoun situation here? Uh, it's like just, just like whatever, bro. I just okay, so you 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 successfully uh, lift her up. So uh, you can use he, she, or they. Yes. All of them, whatever. Okay, cool. Yes, totally. Yeah. All right. So you've you've successfully been lifted. What do you do now? Um, is it? You said it's a peaked roof. Is it mm-hmm. like thatch, or is it like? I would say it's wood. Are you? You're also like you did this on the outside, right? Yes. Okay, so you're on the outside of this like wooden roof. Okay. Is there a chimney? A chimney for the barn? Oh yeah, it's a barn. Um <laughs> right, right, right. Um can I okay, I'm going to look I'm going to try and peel back one of the planks to drop myself in. Uh yeah. Um okay, so you uh why, why don't you scamper around on the roof for a bit and uh see if you can find a loose plank. What are you going to do while she's doing that? I have a, I, I want, you know, like you can place a portal above, a portal below, and then it will like generate momentum. Oh, yeah. And then you could like put another portal elsewhere, and then it would like shoot the goat very high, and then the goat would like land and maybe kill itself just from like landing on the ground. That's what I wanted to do, but you can't do that unless you have a flat surface above and below. So I don't know if I can do that. What I could do is just take the goat with the portal, right? I could like shoot it on the wall, shoot it under the goat, and then the goat would be there. Sure. So you're gonna you're gonna kind of like dip into the barn here. I am going to shoot a portal underneath the goat through the window. Through the window. Through the window. Are you gonna like the window's glass? The window's glass. I'm gonna smash the window. All right. So I want you to roll stealth. Okay. You good or bad at that? The good number is they're both the same. They're both the six. six. So you successfully smash the window. Uh, actually, ooh, six. You smash the window. You cut your hand, and you hear the voice in the distance going, "What? The, what was that? What the okay. fuck was that?" And then the, there's like some footsteps accelerating toward you. And how many is it? You have three portals left. Yeah. Are they coming uh, out of the barn or are they? No, they're coming the from barn? the farmhouse. So they're probably another further, like 50 meters down the road. Okay. And uh, I did a little roll for you there, uh, uh, Smokey. You don't find any loose planks up there? Oh, bro, I have an idea. Pass, toss me your portal gun. I'll portal in through the roof. How are you? How? Is that a thing? Maybe. Well, your two portals are like right, entrance and exits to each portals. other. Okay, right. For some reason, I was thinking it would just make a hole in the roof. So I could, what I could do is shoot a portal through the now broken window and then throw her my portal gun. Yeah, I think that would work. Okay, let's do that. Cool. All right. So you, uh, the goat's a stationary object, so you do all right with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to just lob that thing up to her? Yeah. All right. Why don't, uh, why don't, why doesn't she roll agility to see if she catches it? Okay. 
Are you good uh, or bad at agility? I am bad at it. Five. Fuck. Uh, yeah, so you miss the portal gun. It lands back directly on his head. Cool. Oh, Are there shit. any consequences? Sorry, uh, ow. Uh, I, I, I'm like kind of dazed and uh, I flip her off and then fire a portal at the door instead at the at the wall and walk through it. Okay. So you so you just basically portal to the wall and you like walk into the barn. Right. So the So wait, so you shot a portal under the goat. But the goat there was already out. one sitting on the barn, right? Actually, yeah, the goat the goat will come out of the wall then. Yeah, so the goat um like tumbles out of the wall. Okay. But it still has a tether that is uh linking it to inside. Uh I take the tether and wrap it around the goat's neck in an attempt to oh, Jesus Well, Christ. okay. Which way does the does the gravity work in this scenario? We have to kill the goat, right? So it the... fell through and out the thing. So like it's it's straining trying to run away because it is uh it's 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 sitting next to like a horizontal portal. So it's sitting on flat ground, but it's at the end of its length. Uh I'm gonna yell for Smokey to throw me their hemp rope and then I'm going to try and strangle the goat with the hemp rope. <laughs> okay. Uh, I do that. All right. So and you hear the voices going, Hey, what are you doing with our goat? And uh she drops the the rope down to you. Yeah. And you're gonna you're gonna try and like tie it around the goat's yeah, neck. Yeah, like just wrap it. How long is this uh, hemp rope? Fifty feet. Yeah, so I'm just gonna keep wrapping it and like cinching it tighter and tighter until hopefully the goat is dead. All right. So the Jesus. the goat's trying to fight against you doing this. So can you roll strength here? Does it have like large horns? How big of a goat is this? Uh, it's uh, it's got like medium sized horns. They're kind of they're they're pretty sharp looking. It could like gore me. It could hurt you for sure. Rolling. rolling strength. Okay. Because you're trying to wrangle the goat. I'm not strong, by the way. Uh I rolled a so, four. So you got a four. Um so you're you're not really able to get the like any tension around the goat's neck. Okay. And it's kind of thrashing and it's like stabbing you a bit and it's hurting. Hmm. Um, what are you gonna do here, Smokey? I am thinking like, oh fuck! I bet you that pen had poison in it. That would have been real good to have right now. Um, but I jump off the roof, um, and I'm gonna try and force feed the goat my floor drugs and hope <laughs> to overdose it. <laughs> Perfect plan. Yeah. Uh, so you are you. So you're trying to uh, jam the 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 drugs like in the goat's mouth or what? Yes. Okay. Roll speed on that one. Um. Okay. I. I'm neither good nor bad at speed. So just roll one color. Roll. We'll just we'll just take the blue one. Tick. Eight. eight. Um, eight. So you get the drugs in the goat's mouth, and uh, it bites three. Wait, hold on. What's uh? Let's roll a d4 here. It bites one of your fingers off. Which one is it going to bite off? Uh, hold on. Do I have a five-sided die? Is that a thing? No, it's, your thumb wasn't in the play. Oh, okay. Um, uh, he bites off my pointer finger. All right, so you lose your pointer finger. You're in a lot of pain. And uh, the the guys hear this commotion, and they're all running at you. Uh, but the goat has consumed the drugs. Okay. Uh, hmm. And what else did you guys have in your inventories? What was your other item? Oh, you had nothing. Is there anything you want to declare that you would have had at a festival? Uh, no. All I right. have like I have like my bag, like my water bag. All right. I have like so, a load of bag on a string. Oh, can I have a drink of that? Actually, I got the mad yeah. pasties, bro. Thank you. Mad pasties, no problem. <laughs> I'm here for you. <laughs> Also, I'm just having this thought, like, what if this goat is just chill and it doesn't actually want to be the Yule goat and we just take it back to the festival with us and it's just not the Yule goat anymore. It's just the fun festival goat. Can we just portal out of here? How? Hmm. I think you've got one portal left. Oh, right. 
Where can I shoot it, though? Oh, wait. So we can't get out of here until fe- the guy that gave us the missions b- brings us back? Or I mean, it's up to you what you want to try and do in the situation. You're now being set upon by a bunch of people with, like, torches and pitchforks. And they're freaking out about this goat. So you're probably going to want to make a decision of whether you're, uh, of what you want to do here. Do we kill the goat or run away and try to, like, make a life in the weird... Uh, christmas countryside i vote i vote we pick up the goat and take him with us because like also he's just consumed a lot of drugs that he hasn't done before and he's probably gonna need some some guides yeah you're right certainly with all of my experience we should trip sit the goat we should try and take the goat to sanctuary that is definitely what he needs right now all right so your only impediment here is the goat's tether oh uh can we cut it somehow i'm gonna just, try and chew just close the, the portal that the goat like because if we just close the portal, would that just cut the rope that the ghost tether? Can I just close a single portal and it will cut it? I think that would work. Okay, I'm going to close the portal inside of the barn. All right, so the uh, the closing of the portal severs the te- severs the tether, mm-hmm. and you have you you're still kind of like wrapped around this goat, and uh, you've kind of got the your rope like loosely kind of a bit around its neck, and these people are. These people are screaming at you. There's like ten of them. Like, hey, that's a, that's our that's our goat. Give us a goat. And then one of you starts waving its pitchfork at you. What we should try to do is like shoot my last remaining portal like as far off into the distance as possible. And then since there's already a portal on the wall, we could just like walk through it and we'd be very far away. Yeah. You kept the wall one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would Hell work. Yeah. I'm just going to shoot it off into the distance and hope for Which the best. Which direction? Uh, north. Well, like relative to where you came from. Oh, okay. Um, where are the people coming from? They're coming from the house, which is the opposite of where your like, entryway so you dimensional have, like, portal house, was. all of the hay bales in the field and then barn? You, you have the, like, you're the line of buildings that you approached yep. is in the middle. Okay. So behind you, let's call that north, is the property fence where you came in, where you came in through a dimensional portal, and sway south is the uh, is the like the farmhouse, which was down the road, and that's where all those people are like setting upon you from, and they are like feet away from you. I'm gonna shoot it just way off into wherever past the property line fence. All right, so you fire off that portal. And then you're going to, all of you with the goat, you're just going to try to hop in the portal next to you? Yes. All right. That works. And uh, you find yourself right back where you started. There is, uh, you can kind of see, it's not your portal. It's that like extra dimensional portal. And as you look through your portal, you see these people trying to clamber through your portal at you. I'm going to close it. All right. (laughs) Cut them in half. I want you to roll speed on this to see how this went. You're good at this? No, actually, I'm bad because of the two CI I took. Oh, no. Five. All right. So two of them get through, and the third one you cut in half. So the those two stumble as they're, like, toppled by the, by the, the torso of the pitchfork-wielding person behind them. But they're getting to their feet, and they're, they're trying to grab at you. Um, are we near... Um... The Shrivelly's body? No, you've portaled way the hell away from it. You're oh, you're back okay. next to your original portal that uh, that brought you here. Oh, okay. I thought that that was where he died. Um, okay, never mind. I'm gonna. No, he's in the middle of the field. He's he's all shriveled up over there. Oh, okay. Can we leave through the original interdimensional portal? I don't see why not. Uh, I'm gonna walk through that with the goat. All right. So you you managed to pull the goat into the portal, and uh, what do you do here? Uh, Is the oh, yeah. me? Yeah, sorry, Smokey. What do you do? Oh, yeah. oh I'm I'm also doing it. I'm All going right. So to... since you're the second one through, can we do a quick speed roll for for how this goes? Are you good or bad at speed? Uh, neither. I'm neutral at speed. Just roll one. Six. All right. Uh, so you, with a six, um, the, one of them takes a swing at you with like a machete 
<laughs> and hits your other hand. Mm. And do you want to roll that d4 for me? You lose all four fingers on that hand. Okay, so I'm missing now my pointer finger on one hand and all four fingers on the other hand? Yeah. Okay. So the two of you stumble through the portal, goat and all. You find yourself back in the Xmascom command center, and uh, you stand at the, uh, the feet of the antipope, who sees that you have brought back the goat that you were asked to kill. So the antipope sighs, and he goes, well, you know, I guess it's not a complete failure. And he withdraws like a giant knife from under a table <laughs> and just slits the goat throat right in front of you, and the goat bleeds out in front of you. Uh, kind of making the same like gurgling noises that mm-hmm. your your companion Shrivelly made, and well, you watch the you watch the light drain out of the the goat's eyes. Well, he went out the, the way I would have wanted to go out, tripping balls and high as fuck. Do you want to get your throat slit as well? <laughs> I mean, not yet. Oh, ah, actually, can I borrow that knife? I'd like to cut the goat open and try and see if I can rescue any of the drugs from the inside. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't dissolved yet. Um. Ro- okay. Uh, roll persuasion on that. <laughs> what is your persuasion? Um, I am neutral on persuasion. Six. Six. He goes, no, get, I, listen, you quit wasting my time. You did a horrible job. I mean, okay, you did fine job. I will pay you in more drugs on your way out. Just see my assistant, uh, Snigut, um, uh, my assistant, uh, Lucy, and uh, I must go. I have people to see, things to do, and of course, those are euphemism for interrogation and torture, respectively. So, yeah, uh, any, she'll help you with anything you need. And, uh, well, and he just like walks off into, uh, into a side door marked dungeon and the door snaps shut behind him. And you're just left there with the, uh, the assistant you were with in the shuttle. And in that beautiful angelic voice, she says, okay, you want to go back to one timeline now? And, uh, she kind of like opens a new hatch in the floor. And if you look into it, you can see the camp you were in. I I, uh, look down at the goat and I shake my head and I say, greatest of all time. And then I go through the hatch. I'm going to pick up the goat carcass and try to bring it with me through the hatch. (laughs) Uh, She smacks your hand away and shoves you into the hatch. And she goes, enough of you. And uh, just take this. And she like stuffs a hundred bucks into your back pocket. Hmm. You find yourself in the camp that you left from, and you have you find yourself with uh, mutilated fingers, and you you have that glass injury, right? Uh, what was that from? Yeah, from when you smashed the window. Yes, definitely. So you've got like shards of glass in your hand, and Smokey, you are you can see that your fingers are all like on the ground. Uh, there's there's like a bloody knife next to all of them, and you everyone in the camp is like screaming at both of you, like ma- yelling at you for trashing the whole camp. The whole camp is trashed, uh, and you're bleeding everywhere. And somebody's calling for medical, and uh, you know to try and reattach your fingers. Uh, but you do happen to notice that you do indeed, uh, Yvonne, you have hundred bucks in your back pocket. And, uh, Smokey, you've got a, you know, you've got, like, a nice little dime bag of whatever, whatever you want in your, in your pocket. I got a fucking dime bag for that shit? <laughs> well, you got, you got, like, a whole, yeah, a whole gram. Um, sick. And I look at Powder Puff and I go, oh, a puff, like, like, weed puff, like, smoking a joint, man. I'm like, oh, it's like, two, your name's cool in two ways. I just got that. And I tried Did to hold up Did you try to hold up? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have my fingers, but I'm just like, it's just like a fist, because I don't have any fingers on my hand. I'm like, it's too, oh, shit, it's, it's cool in two ways, though, bro. Um, and the festival ends, and uh, you have alienated all your friends. <laughs> but uh, you know, you did get some money and drugs out of it, and that Christmas, that Christmas ends up feeling a little bit different. You know, there's it's hard to put your finger on it, but uh, somehow you just feel a little more godly, 
and you just feel a little a little less pagan, which is uh, you know an, an odd feeling for festival goers. But that's the story of your uh, your summer and Christmas of 2012. Feels so right. Orthodox uh, Christmas is the most Christmas. That's what that's what the angel have told you. Yeah. Forced by fear and torture. You know, <laughs> Christmas works in mysterious ways. I dig it. Yeah. And uh this show also works in mysterious ways. Is there uh is there any parting words you'd like to leave us with, Adam? Um thank you for letting me be the Croatian person of my dreams. 